Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug, if you haven't already. Today's episode of Car Crazy, we'll sit down with Chris Akonamaki, considered to be the Dean of Motorsports Journalism. And with over 40 years of broadcasting, he's seen a lot of action. He has some fascinating behind the scenes stories that he'll share with us. Then we'll go to our favorite gala event at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Yes, it's time for the annual Cars and Stars Gala, this year featuring million dollar cars. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Chris Economaki has been around racing all of his life and is considered the world's best known reporter on the auto racing scene. He began his first column in his teens and he never looked back. In 1950, he became editor of National Speed Sport News, but he is probably most recognizable from his lengthy career on television and by his distinguishable voice. And fortunately for Carol Shelby, some of the men that possessed those talents many years ago are still around. What started out as track announcing led to 23 years with ABC's Wide World of Sports, as well as stints on CBS, ESPN, and Speed Vision. During his broadcast career, he has covered every form of auto racing. And because of the style and the enthusiasm he brings to the sport, he continually received awards and honors throughout his fabulous career. We sat down with him at the SEMA show to relive his amazing career. I shouldn't say it, but I kind of grew up with you, you know, and uh, yeah. more than anybody else, you got me into motor racing, enjoying the sport. Oh, You're thanks. always there. You covered all the great races and the tragedies and the, the ups and the downs and the, you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat uh, on uh, Wide World of Sports and ABC for so many years. And, uh, well, my, uh, my late wife used to say that uh, racing was my mistress, and I guess it has been. Oh, you, were, you were married to him. You were. You really were. How did it all begin? Well, we had a racetrack in New Jersey, Hohokus, New Jersey, which was the next town where I lived, and you could hear the roar, roar every weekend, and it was like a magnet. And I went up there and went under the fence, over the fence, through the fence. Uh, really, in, in, the, in the early 1930s, nobody had the 40 cents that the admission was. With the Depression, it was terrible. There was no money. 40 cents. 40 cents was the admission. And during the Depression, two businesses flourished, the movies and auto races, I guess because of the need for entertainment. Well, I got into the racetrack, and the leading driver of the area was also from Ridgewood. He's a taxi driver named Bob Saul. And then a day or two after the races, I went into a barber shop and found out that his father was the barber, and he was my barber. And he liked to go to races and watch his son drive. So he would take me to the races with him, what in those days, 1932 and 33, were far away places. People didn't travel as much then as they do today. And I became a, a, a traveler. He would come to pick me up sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to some racetrack 200 miles away. And when I got there, I was with these adults, and here I was, 13 years old, and you know, what are you going to do with it? Oh so they give me a bucket. Uh, most of the races were at fairgrounds, and the water was way over there someplace. And go get a bucket of water and bring it back, fill up the radar in this front neck, and then you love this, <laughs> polish the car. There we go. So that's what I did at the beginning. I had to, I had to polish cars. there and keep it shiny, wipe the windshield and so forth. So, so you, went, you graduated for that. What an great, I'm still polishing cars. There you, you know? go, all right. Just, not bad. Not bad. No, just not all bad. <laughs> so that's how it got started. And uh, I hung around. And then uh, the newspaper that covered racing, actually it was a 
broadsheet, the small town newspaper in East Patterson, New Jersey, where all the racers came for the uh, fair season, the end of June through October. And so the racing started to appear in the back page of the Bergen Herald. And one day in the summer of 1934, I was walking down Oak Street in Ridgewood, New Jersey, which was an upscale town and had its own newspaper with a rotary press. And there in the window of the Ridgewood News was the first issue of the tabloid format, National Speed Sport News. And I went in and got 200 copies, took them to the racetrack that weekend and sold them for a nickel apiece, made a penny. And I made $2 <laughs> wow. and selling 400 copies of the paper. And that's 50 miles away on Saturday night selling 40 copies of the paper. And I, I couldn't understand the disparity because there were more people at the Saturday night track than there were at the Friday night track. And it dawned on me that the difference was the announcer. The Friday night guy said, hey, have you seen the latest issue of Speed Sport? Wow, how about that story on page five? Everybody's talking about it. The Saturday night guy says, the latest issue is here, buy it. So I said, if this is what it takes to sell a paper, I'm gonna become an announcer. No. And I did, and I wasn't bad. No kidding. In 1960, CBS came to Daytona Beach uh, for a day of racing that was created for television. And unfortunately, it got miserable reviews. It really was not a good television show. So in 1961, when ABC, Wide World of Sports was founded, ABC came in and said, we want to televise your July 4th race. And Fran said, you go back to New York. You were here last year, and you smelled out the place. He said, no, 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 no. That was the other, they were the other guy. <laughs> you know, he said, well, what was the trouble? He said. The announcers didn't know which way the cars went. I always remember that line. And they said, well, we have, we have Jim McKay. I said, don't tell me about Jim McKay. They had Walter Cronkite. <laughs> so, so they negotiated and so forth. And finally, uh, uh, ABC said, well, what can we do uh, to make you feel good about us doing a TV? She said, well, get an announcer that knows and understands the sport. And they said, well, where do we find this guy? And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you my guy, and it was me. So I was pushed on to ABC and, uh, for the July 4th race in 1961, and I've been there ever since, yeah. Incredible. After the break, Chris Economaki talks about some of the famous drivers he's known throughout the years. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy, and more with Chris Economaki. The great memories. You have you have three or four just poignant memories. Maybe a victory that nobody expected, or a breakdown at the wrong time when they had the race won, and well, the heartbreaks. A lot, a lot uh, of things like that. There's been some wonderful, uh, great stories. Uh, in 1950, I traveled the circuit for a promoter all over the Northeast, and Johnny Parsons was the star. We became very good friends. And I, about halfway through the season, I said, "Hey, Johnny, let me warm up your car for you at a 220 off -y. He said, yeah, later, later, later. So now comes the last race, and he says, get in. Huh. My big chance, <laughs> a 220 cubic inch Offenhauser, owned by the winner of the Indianapolis 500, and I am gonna warm this thing up. Had 650, 60 knobby tires on the back, loose dirt racetrack. Who, would, who could ask for anything more? Right, right. So I get in the car, and then I get, start getting instructions. It had a handbrake with a button on it. And the mechanic says, all right, Chris, he says, here's what you do. He says, you hold the button down on the handbrake, but you don't pull the handbrake back. And of course, then you had a rope around the front axle that come in the cockpit, and you hold the rope and the steering wheel with your right hand, he said. And when the tow truck pulls you off, you let the clutch out, and then you watch the dashboard, and when the oil pressure gets to 80, you lift your finger off the button, and it will start. He says, and don't screw it up. Well, I got it started. And it was like an explosion. I, I, I couldn't get my foot off the gas enough. The ex, ex, gas pedal was, you couldn't, there was no place for your foot except the gas pedal. So I took my, I'm holding my foot up like this, <laughs> and I come down the straightaway, we're going about 40 miles an hour, boom, 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 boom. And there I just say, you'll foul it up, you'll foul it up. Yeah, so step I out stepped of it. on the gas, and there's this explosion in the dirt, and the car goes up, and I figure, I, I knew what to do. I turned to the right and straight out. Now I get over on the back stretch. And I'm doing about 65 miles an hour, which was fine. And Tommy Hinnishitz, the leading driver, he pulls up alongside of me on the left. And Bill Schindler pulls up alongside <laughs> of me on the right, and they go like this. Yeah, come on. <laughs> and I went. 
<laughs> Not today, thank you. And then they stood on the gas and crisscrossed in front of me and just drowned me in dirt because I'd been announcing about them all year long and telling stories about them and so forth. And this was their way of getting even, you know. <laughs> it was a, a very interesting and thrilling and memorable moment for it me. It had to be. 34 years, network television. You knew all the drivers, great right. and the small. Any personal favorites? Oh, yeah, A.J. Foyt. Uh, he, uh, he still subscribes to National Speed Sport News every year. I get his check with it. Uh, I tell you about A.J. Foyt. He's a tough guy. But when A.J. was upset with me, he came to me. He didn't sell somebody down the pitch. You see what that SOB wrote about me this week? He comes to me, and, and I got it. And, you know, 10 days later, it was over with, with pals again. And Mario Andretti is a very good, close and good friend of mine. Uh, and they are two guys that are poles apart, Boy. poles apart. Really? Yeah. Again, the hard luck of Mario Andretti. Is this just amazing? You know what they say the most uh, often heard phrase at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Mario Andretti's car is slowing down. <laughs> <laughs> that was been that's been pronounced uh, dozens of times. You know. <laughs> yeah. Parnelli Jones, incredible guy. Uh, he had. Uh, congenitally, uh, Carnelli Jones didn't have to learn anything about driving racing cars. God gave him those skills. He got in the car and he knew what to do. What Parnelli would do, I announced the last outlaw race Parnelli drove before he went to the AAA. And I watched him at this track in Indiana, Winchester, Indiana, a lot of cars, and Parnelli was looking over the guys directly in front of him at somebody way up there to plot his course. Very few other drivers do have that. Have the presence of mind he's to be got, able to do that. He's got incredible skills uh, uh, as a racing driver and a nice guy, too. Yeah. One of my buddies back home uh, and one of the sweetest guys in all of motorsports, Dan Gurney. Oh, yeah. Very good. Dan's a wonderful guy. Dan, Dan Gurney has one problem as a racing driver. He, in all the years I've been in racing, all the years, I have never heard a racing driver say, the car is perfect, leave it alone. Just, just touch it a little more, make it better. Well, Dan could never leave his car alone. He, could, he would get to the apogee of performance, you get out of it and say, okay, we're gonna make it better, and that would, it would go downhill from there. And he, he was like many other drivers. But Dan Gurney was a very exceptional driver, both on road courses and on the ovals. Not too many guys who excel in both of those. Yeah, and a wonderful guy. I followed those races and your voice. Just to listen to your voice, I'm sitting here listening. I thought, I'm interviewing Chris Akatabashi. You know, I was getting a pair of shoes in Des Moines, Iowa. The guy's on his knees. He's looking down at the floor. I see the boss part in the back of his head. And he says, are you on television? I said, yes. Well, I, said, I thought I recognized the voice. <laughs> he looked at me, didn't know who I was, but knew, it, knew me from my voice. voice. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely. Cursed. I, I can't get away from it. Fantastic. You, know? you better yeah. be good. I guess so, yeah. Right. Thanks Chris, very much for the time. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming in for this. My Thank pleasure. That. My pleasure. Good luck with Meguiar. Don't leave now. When Meguiar's Car Crazy returns, we hit the red carpet at the Cars and Stars Gala at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Every year, the Peterson Automotive Museum holds a gala featuring a diverse genre of cars that always bring out the stars. The sixth annual event featured a cadre of million dollar cars. We had a crew upstairs to show you the cars and one downstairs on the red carpet to greet the stars. My good buddy and co-chairman of the Peterson Automotive Museum, Bruce Meyer, filled in on hosting duties for me while I was at another event. He talked to fellow co-chair, Peter Mullen first. I just went upstairs and the display is remarkable. So the Peterson has once again, I think, outdone itself. You know, our opening display here at the Peterson Automotive Museum is still being talked about today, and that was basically your collection of French cars, and it made car people out of non-car people. And tonight, you've brought some of those cars back, have you not? Well, I brought two of the cars back, a teardrop, Tabo Lago, uh, which is my favorite piece of automotive sculpture of all time and the 1939 World's Fair Delahaye, which was France's uh, entrant into the New York World's Fair to demonstrate what the French could really do in both car design and in engineering and in performance. So I'm thrilled to have them both back here tonight. And are those cars worth a million dollars, do you think, on a good day? 
Uh, well, you throw a couple more in together, we might round it off. <laughs> One of your cars is kind of the feature car here tonight the Bugatti Atlant S. This is just one of your many valuable cars. What are your thoughts having it here tonight? Well, it's fantastic. And I think the Peterson is probably as fine a venue for that car to be shown at as, as anything I can think of. We asked the stars, what makes a car worth over seven digits? Does the notion of a million dollar car or a $10 million car, does that, does that kind of ring a bell? Well, you know, I never, I don't think of them as, as numbers like that. I think of them as pieces of art, you know, such as the cars here in the Peterson collection. Yeah. It's just awesome. The million dollar car is probably not where you'd spend your next... Well, it, they're interesting because if you look at the, uh, the cars that are beside the automobiles, they originally cost $8,000. Now they're selling for three million, you know. Well, if a Norm Crosby owns it, you see it adds value to the car. Exactly, if I had an old pair of pants that I wore when I was seven, I could sell it now for like nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, in Los Angeles, with all the um, uh, potential danger out there on the streets, um, I, I tend to, I only want to drive the half million dollar car. I don't really want to drive the million dollar car out there on the streets of LA, you know, so, because you've got to, you know, you've got to park, you've got to give it to valets. A car you probably wouldn't want to risk on the streets of LA is this remarkable 1937 Alfa Romeo HC 2900B Millimilia Spider, once hidden in an Italian cheese factory during World War II. It's considered one of the most rare and desirable cars of its kind. What do you think of when you, somebody mentions you a car worth millions and millions of dollars? I immediately think that there is going to be a car that I will never have. <laughs> you see, I have, when I, I've made a lot of money, but I have uh, 15 and a half great grandchildren, uh, nine grandchildren, and three children, and uh, money keeps them in touch with me. <laughs> a million dollar car, I could have bought it for $15,000 at the right go. time. Of course, I didn't have any money at that time. So well, you could have bought a Daytona Cobra Coupe for four or five thousand from Carroll oh, Shelby. Yeah. I mean, you have driven probably more million-dollar cars. Now they weren't worth a million, right, when exactly. you drove? <laughs> you owned the million-dollar cars we're going to see tonight oh, when yeah. they weren't a million dollars. That's right. Right. <laughs> and did you buy them all without power steering so you could work on your arm? Absolutely. I heard you talking about Jaguars. Do you have a favorite car? Do you have a million dollar car, I'm a Connie? I'm car person. I have seven cars. I know I'm a girl, too. <laughs> so you're car crazy. I'm car crazy. Stars have always loved their cars. Steve McQueen was totally car crazy over his 1956 Jaguar XKSS. It's painted his favorite color of British racing green. This car spent some time in the care of Bill Hara before finding its current home with the Petersons. I bought the Cobra Daytona Coupe that uh, we won the World Manufacturer Championship. Uh, Shelby said, you have to buy this car. It's $4,000. I didn't have any money to speak of them. And he said, I don't care, you gotta get the money out. So I went out and got, uh, guys helped me and I bought it for four grand. I sold it for 10 later on. The cars weren't worth anything yet. Next guy sold it for, uh, for 20, the next guy sold it for three and a half million dollars. And you know, one just traded hands for four and a half. Is that right? Don't go away. We have more million dollar beauties to show you when McGuire's Car Crazy returns. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles for their sixth annual Cars and Stars Gala, where we ask the stars what makes a car worth a million dollars or more. Well, oftentimes what makes a car worth especially a lot of money is who owned it and who rode in it. So we think that a Ronda Fleming car would work beautifully. I doubt that, but it would be a, it would be a thrill to be you know a part of that. But I. I don't know what they do with the cars after we, you know, finish a film. Some of these cars are very old and they're very, very delicate. It's like a fine wine, maybe you want to treat it very gentle. You don't drop a wrench on one of these. No way. And you put lots and lots of protection on them. A couple of scenes, you got bodies on them that are just hard to repair in the paint jobs. Oh, God, they're gorgeous. Anything that's kept pristine sweet all its life becomes a classic. After 25 years, anything that has been taken care of, a house, a car, a person, a bite of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> One car that has certainly been well cared for is this 1938 Delahaye Type 135M competition roadster. 
that was originally built as a custom for a wealthy French motoring enthusiast. It is one of only 10 ever built and one of three survivors now in the collection of Margie and Bob Peterson. Some of the other eye candy in the exhibit upstairs include this 1939 Mercedes-Benz W154 M163 Grand Prix. My co-host Bruce Meyer's 1957 Ferrari 625 TRC 250 Tessarossa. A beautiful 1928 Bentley 6.5 liter. A 1956 Chevy Corvette SR2. And a 1939 Bugatti Type 57C Roadster once owned by the Shah of Iran. When all was said and done, all eyes on the red carpet were drawn to Bruce's shoes. Let me ask you something. How do I look tonight? How's my outfit and particularly my shoes? Now tell the truth. Uh, beautiful. Here, look. It's a nightmare. Are they okay for tonight? No. <laughs> They're not okay for any night. Where'd you steal them? No one would dare sell those. They'd come back. You can have fast shoes, too. Those are the best shoes I have ever seen. Mr. Blackwell didn't have much to say right about through. them. Really? Yeah, he, he was probably he would, envious. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> no Cars and Stars gala would be complete without the Barrett Jackson Classic Car Auction, giving guests the opportunity to bid on cars that may be worth a million dollars one day. If you're certifiable, send us a video of yourself by your car telling us just how car crazy you really are. The best videos become part of a new segment on this show. All entries will become the property of McGuire's Car Crazy. For more details, go to carcrazycentral.com. Well, that's all for now. This is such a treat for me to share some of the great people of my life with you. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we have, and I hope these stories will make you just a little bit more car crazy. Thanks for watching. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of appearance car care products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.